Hey Life Bridge, it is Saturday morning and we are out here doing what you've done, quite frankly. We're giving away all the gift cards for the Kindness for Kids gift card collection drive that we've been doing for the last month or so. We've raised over $31,000, which is double the need from last year. And we were able to raise all of that through our congregation donations. You guys are amazing. What you've been able to step up and do for people that wouldn't have Christmas gifts otherwise, you guys have done an amazing job. Thank you so much for your generosity. You are being the hands and feet in Jesus. Uh, this means that we get to provide our kids with a, just a little bit of a better Christmas. And... Pues muchísimas gracias por las tarjetas. Este, la verdad son de gran ayuda ahorita en este tiempo. Este, te los agradezco de todo corazón. De verdad, muchísimas gracias. Hi, we're super excited. Um, this means a lot because, well, things are hard this time of year, and we just, you know, really appreciate you guys lightening up our our load. Thank you. Yeah. How cool is that, right? I mean, talk about a massive win. That, that's, we're helping other families win. Like, we had so many cars in our parking lot yesterday. Like Scott said, we doubled the need from last year. There were, there were more people, double the amount of people that came uh, that signed up last year that signed up this year. And not only could we take care of all the people that, that showed up and that asked for help, Y'all actually gave more. Like as a church, we gave so much that we have extra. So there will be people that show up this week and next week and right before Christmas and we'll help there too. Yeah, we celebrate that. That's awesome. That's just what we do. I mean, talk about a great example of helping, helping families win, being generous, passing out hope. That's all we did yesterday in the parking lot, even though it was freezing last Saturday, it would have been shorts and a t-shirt, but thank you, Colorado. We got to do it in the cold weather yesterday. We're just passing out hope. That's a great example of our church living like we've already won instead of living like we're trying to win. We unpacked that last week, and, and really this week is, is part two of what we started last week. One of the promises of Christmas is a promise of victory. And we all like to win. Winning is fun, right? Anybody like to win? Everybody should raise their hand right now, right? Yeah, yeah. And if you don't, you're, you're lying, right? Everybody likes to win. But so often, it just feels like we're losing it life. I mean, maybe it feels like you're just losing because things with your marriage aren't great. Or you're not connecting with your kids. Or maybe your job feels like a disaster right now. Or you're looking around and you're like, man, do I really have any real friends? You turn on the news. That feels like nothing but losing. Losing just, it feels wrong, does it not? But then maybe you can sense something going on that's even a little bit deeper. All these setbacks that maybe you've experienced in life or whenever you see discouragements, when it feels like nothing is going right, it, you don't want to be dramatic, but it feels like you're under attack or like there's something against you. And there is. There is something against you. There is an enemy. His name is Satan. And he's waging a very real spiritual war in our world and one against you personally. Ephesians 6, 12, it says this, we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. We're not, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. And I know that that can sound kind of weird. Like it's really easy to think, you know, hey, Matt, that's cool, but we are rational people. We've been educated. We don't believe in mythical hysteria like that. I get it. It's really easy to think that. And that's exactly what the enemy wants us to think. He wants us to think that that's crazy, that that's not true, that only fools believe in that kind of things. We don't believe in that stuff, only fools believe in that. But if we fall for that trick, if you believe that there's not an enemy, that there's not a spiritual war going on right now, a battle that's meant to discourage you, it's meant to push you away and get you to run away from Jesus. If you don't believe that that's actually true, then you and I are more vulnerable to fall prey to it. But the good news is, like all that stuff's coming to an end. It's all coming into an end. And how do we know? Christmas. Christmas is the reason why we know that's coming to an end. Christmas is a promise of victory. I mean, last week we used this analogy. We compared the very first Christmas to D-Day. Maybe not something that you would normally do, but hear it out. When the Allies landed on the beaches of Normandy, at that point, victory in World War II in Europe was locked up. Yeah, there was still gonna be fighting for sure. But at that point, it was only a matter of time. The war was already won. Victory was locked up. Christmas is the exact same thing. When Jesus was born, that was the beginning of the end. 
Yes, there's still going to be fighting. We're experiencing it today, are we not? But it's only a matter of time. The war has been won. Christmas is the beginning of the end. And Christmas means that we win. The end means we win. Romans 8, there's kind of a victory chant in that. Listen to this. Paul says, Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he's sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. So he died for us. He was raised to life for us. And he's pleading for us. Can anything separate us from Christ's love? Rhetorical question. Does it mean he no, does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? No, despite all things, we have overwhelming victory. It is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Do you know what the word nothing there is translated? You know what it means? It means nothing, nothing. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's victory. That's all that is. That's victory. That means that you're winning, even if it feels like you're losing, if you're following Jesus. Christmas means that we win. But there's something else that goes along with with victory. There's something that goes hand in hand whenever you see victory. Do you know what it is? What goes hand in hand with victory? Peace. Peace always goes with victory. When World War II was over in Europe, that's when peace came. The same thing with Christmas. If it's a promise of victory, that means it's a promise of peace also. But can we, can we be real for just a second? It doesn't seem very peaceful right now, does it? I think if you were given a word, one word to describe this moment in world history, if you were given one word to describe the tone that's going on all around us, I doubt anyone would use the word peaceful. Like none of us would, right? So maybe Christmas just isn't living up to its promise. And it's not. It's not if you believe that peace is a feeling or if peace is the absence of conflict. We'll come back to that one in a minute. But peace is in high demand right now, isn't it? Like we all want it, we we crave it, we just need peace in our lives. Like if you are a parent, you know what I'm talking about. Stop banging on the door, let me go to the bathroom in peace. Said every parent, amen, amen? Yeah, good grief. Did you ever think that your life, that you would define peace in your life as three minutes of alone time in the bathroom? That's real life, right? The struggle is real. But on a serious note, like, where do you need peace? Right now, where do you need it? Do you need it in your marriage? Like you and your spouse, you just, I don't know, it just seems like fight after fight. We're not connecting. Maybe it's in your job. It feels like a disaster right now and the stress is, you know, it's borderline unbearable. You just need some wins. You need some things to calm down. Maybe it's with one of your kids. You're just at each other's throat. Or maybe something's going on with one of your kids that's not their fault. It's not your fault either. Someone or something else is messing with your kid and you need that to be dealt with. You need that to be resolved before you can ever have peace. Maybe you need peace of mind. The anxiety is intense. Depression, discouragement, doubt. Just feels like there's an all out assault on your mind. And where do you need peace right now? Because we all want it and we were meant to have it. When God created man and woman in the garden, they were at complete peace with each other. That sounds great, right? Men and women at complete peace. That sounds awesome. That was a nervous laugh right there. It's okay, safe place. But even more so, they were at complete peace with God in the garden. That's what we were meant to have. That's what you and I were created to operate with that kind of peace. But obviously that's gone now, right? Now we live in a world that's full of war and disease and injustice and equality, things lacking, abuse, anxiety, addiction. I mean, I don't need to go on. I don't think, do I? We live in a world now that's full of conflict. 
And that conflict, every time you experience conflict, it just, it just fuels this desire to have the peace that you and I were meant to have, that we were meant to operate with. So what we start doing is we start looking for it wherever we can find it. Where can I find peace? So we start looking wherever we can. Maybe I can find peace if I can just escape for a little while. Can I escape from, from the pressure, from the pain, from the position I'm in? If I can just escape for a little while, then I'll have peace. And the world is more than willing to take you up on that. They're more than willing to provide you with all kinds of ways to escape with a promise of peace on the back end. I mean, this is what Netflix, what Apple TV, what every streaming service is doing. It's saying, hey, hey, we can help you escape for, from reality for just a little while, and then you'll have peace. All you've got to do is binge on this 42-minute episode. And if you need a little bit more peace, just click the next episode button. <laughs> now, to be clear, I'm, I'm, I'm all in on Apple TV or Netflix. I have them, all good things. But you're never going to find peace there. You're not. And you can't escape from reality either. That's where every addiction starts off at. Whether it's drugs, alcohol, pornography, food. It's this promise to escape for a little while and then you'll have some peace. The problem is you can't escape. It does the opposite. It enslaves you. And there's never, ever peace in any kind of captivity. Ask anybody who has dealt with addiction before. Anybody who has somebody that has an addiction background in their family or a close friend. There's no peace in any of that. Or we're led to believe that if we accomplish stuff, if we accumulate more things, we can find peace in that. So climb the corporate ladder, get the promotion, get the scholarship, win every war, award you possibly can, competitive people. If you were here last week, you know what I'm talking about. Man, increase your income while you can. John D. Rockefeller, who was the richest man in the world at the time, he was once asked, how much money is enough? And Rockefeller famously replied, he said, just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. And what a ridiculous thing for the richest man in the world to say. I mean, how out of touch do you have to be? What do you mean, you, you need more money? You have more money than anyone on the planet. That's like Elon Musk today saying, yeah, I just need a little bit more money. Really? You're the richest person on the planet. You can sell just a few stock shares and worth billions today. You don't need any more money. How out of touch are you? What do you mean just a little bit more? But if we really think about it, you and I are sold the exact same lie every single day. The more we accomplish, the more we accumulate, just a little bit more, then you got more freedom, more comfort, and more security. And the more freedom, comfort, and security that you got, the more peace you'll have. Every individual person in the world can fall into this pattern of thinking. I have. We think that we can obtain peace in whatever it is that we lack. If that's a material need, something that we want or we need. Well, if I get the house, this new house that I want, if I get a new car that's not always in the shop, if I get some new clothes, if I get some new kicks, then I will have peace. We look for it in what we don't have. This is what's behind every single movement today too. Every movement in the world is looking for peace in things that we don't have, like equality. If we could just get to the place where every person on the planet experiences equality, then we'll have peace. Or justice. We've got to eradicate injustice in the world. That's the reason why there's conflict. That's the reason why there's no peace. I mean, any movement that you can think of, any movement in the world is trying to right a wrong, whether that's a legitimate wrong or it's just a perceived wrong. It's trying to right a wrong with the belief that once we do that, then we'll have peace. Now, now to be clear, we should pursue things like, like equality. All people are created equal. The reason why all people are created equal is because every man, woman, and child is an image bearer of God. That is a very, very big deal. You are an image bearer of God. That's why we treat people as equals. We should pr pursue justice. Absolutely. We have a God that is a God of justice. All throughout scripture, you see him telling his people, pursue justice, seek justice, do justice. Not just talk about it, not just theorize about it. No, do justice. Absolutely. We go after all of those things. But the pursuit of those things, as great as that is, the end of those roads will never end in peace. 
and it'll never end in peace. Every movement in the world today, there is a conscious or a subconscious belief that if we get what we don't have, then we'll have peace. If we achieve justice over here, that's great. It's amazing. We should celebrate that. We should do that. But if we achieve justice over here, there's still injustice over there. It never ends. That's my point. It never ends. There's never rest from it. We will never arrive. Again, we should absolutely go after those things, righteous things like justice. But what we tend to do is we don't seek out justice for justice sake. We seek out justice so that we can have peace on the back end. It'll never happen. We'll never have complete peace in this world because this world is broken. So Matt, where are you going with this? This doesn't sound like Christmas. Where do we find peace right now then? Because obviously Christmas isn't living up to its promise then. Here's where we're at right now. Let me give you the context that we live in. Right now we live in the middle of God has come and God will come. Right in between those two things. God has come. He was born in a manger, put on human flesh to achieve peace for you and I so that we could be made whole in him. God has already come. That's Christmas. And he's coming back. But when he comes back, he's not coming as a vulnerable baby. He's coming as the king that he is. That's when we will experience the fulfillment of peace. When he comes back, we get to enjoy what we were meant to have for all of eternity. Right now, we're living in the in-between. We're right in between. We're in between Jesus has come and come Lord Jesus come. We're living in between Luke chapter 2 and Revelation 22. But where we get to experience peace right now is knowing that he is coming back. There's peace knowing that Jesus is coming back. He already came the first time. He made good on what he said the first time. So why would we ever doubt him with what he said about the second time? You can have peace right now knowing no matter what is going on in your life, no matter what is going on in the world around you, knowing that Jesus is coming back. And when he does, victory is complete. When he does, that's when we will experience the fulfillment of all of our expectations, our hopes, and the promises that he's given us. When he does, that's when we will experience the joys and the pleasures and eternal life that's waiting for you. When he does, there will be no more pain or suffering or disease or anxiety or addiction or injustice or inequality or lacking anything. When he does, if your faith is in Jesus, that's when you have an inheritance that's waiting for you as an adopted son or or daughter of the king, there's peace knowing that's coming. That's when we will experience complete peace. It's finished. What we're craving, what we've been meant to have. But until then, we're still gonna see brokenness. Peace is knowing that Jesus is in control right now. And maybe that's the only thing that you need to hear today is that Jesus is in control. Man, my life feels like it's out of control. Nothing's going right. I'm losing. I can tell, I can tell this spiritual battle that's going on. That stuff is for real. This week was a crazy week for me on that end. Some crazy stuff happened this week on the spiritual side of stuff. It's funny when you talk about spiritual for, warfare the week before and then you walk into this the next seven days, don't be surprised, right? When stuff comes after you. Man, I, I just, nothing's going right. What are you talking about, Matt? Here's where peace is knowing that Jesus is in control. He's not asleep at the wheel. He's not surprised by anything that's going on with you right now. You can know that he's in control. Peace is not a feeling. It's not positive thoughts. It's not the results of certain actions taken either. Peace is not in a movement. It's in a manger. Peace isn't in a movement in the world. It's in a manger. Peace is a person. But what the world wants is, the world wants the kingdom without the king. And our world wants everything that comes with the kingdom of God. Our world wants the peace, wants the perfection, it wants the paradise. Our world wants the kingdom of God, they just don't want King Jesus. So every movement that you see going on in the world today, every value proposition that gets put in front of you, every time someone wants to deconstruct society and build something else, all of those are an attempt to recreate what we lost in the Garden of Eden. We're craving what we were meant to have. We're craving the peace that we lost. Every movement in the world is trying to rebuild the garden. The problem is you cannot have the kingdom without the king. It doesn't work that way. It's an exercise in futility because it's King Jesus that makes the kingdom. That's what you're searching for. 
It doesn't matter who you are or what your story is. It doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not. What you're searching for is the kingdom of God. That satisfaction that you want, that fulfillment, that purpose, that peace, the thing that you're longing for, even if you couldn't put a name on it, let me tell you what it is. This is absolute truth. It's the kingdom of God. That's what you're looking for. But you can't have the kingdom without the king. Nor do you want the kingdom without the king. So where do we find it right now then? While we're living in the in-between, then what is peace? How do we get it? Great question. And I love it when you guys ask questions that are in my notes. It makes it really easy for me. First, we gotta know what it's not. Peace is not the absence of conflict. It's usually where our minds go, right? We're banging on the bathroom door, seriously. We usually think the absence of conflict means peace, but that's not what it is. The absence of conflict is heaven. We're not there yet. In the meantime, you can have peace in the midst of conflict. In fact, that's where you're meant to experience it. But if we think that the only way for us to obtain peace is to eliminate all conflict, then we are living in a fantasy world and we're only gonna be discouraged every time we do see conflict. You can have peace right now in the midst of conflict. It's also, it's not positive thinking. Positive thoughts are great, great. We should be the most positive people in the world, but it's not positive thinking. And peace is not a feeling either. Feelings change, they're not reliable. Real peace is so much more reliable than a feeling, it's so much more stable. So then what is it? What, what is peace right now? Let me give you a couple of things. No, number one, we already hit on, peace is a person. It's a person. Ephesians 2.14 says, he himself, meaning Jesus, he himself is our peace. Jesus came as the Prince of Peace. We celebrate that title this time of year more than any other time of the year. That's a name that was given by Isaiah. Isaiah prophesied about Jesus coming 700 years before Christmas actually happened and said, hey, the Prince of Peace is gonna come. That's what we're gonna call him. It's a person. Peace is about stability. It's a refuge. It's exactly who Jesus is. Jesus is our stability. He is our refuge. Peace is a person. It's also a position. Romans 5.1 says this, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done. It's talking about the doctrine of justification, meaning you've been justified, you've been made right in God's sight because of your faith in Jesus. Look at it this way. Imagine uh, you're in a courtroom and you are the defendant and your entire life is on trial. How uncomfortable do you feel right now, right? And all of the evidence of your life is laid out in front of the court. Everyone in the court can see all of the evidence. It is very clear and it is damning against you. You're like, I got no hope. There's nothing I can do to make, I, I can't do anything. And then the judge slams down the gavel, looks at you and says, innocent. Not because of anything that you've done, because of what he's done. I put my faith in Jesus. Now you have right standing with the court, right? You have right standing with the state because you've been declared innocent. That's what justification does. Because of your faith in Jesus, you have been justified to God. You've been made right in his eyes. Right standing with God, that's a really, really peaceful place to be. There's peace when you know that your position is one of right standing with God. And peace is also a presence. It's a presence too. In John 14, 27, it says this, I am leaving you with a gift. This is Jesus talking. I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. Sign me up, that sounds great. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. We search for it in the world in all different places. Jesus says, if you want real peace of mind and heart, the world can't give it, only I can. So don't be troubled or afraid. Remember what I told you, I'm going away, but I will come to you again. The gift of peace that he's talking about it's the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you've given your life to Jesus and you're faithfully following him, you have God's presence inside of you. When we unpacked this a little bit more earlier in this series, it's pretty awesome, right? To have the God of peace, his presence in you. It's amazing. Like this should blow our minds. That's a peace that goes beyond all understanding. That's one of the reasons why it's a gift of the Holy Spirit or a fruit of the Holy Spirit. 
Galatians 5 talks about, hey, the more you grow in Christ, the more you're going to have peace. Not only for yourself, but you're going to give it to other people too. God's presence living in you is amazing. It's one thing to achieve peace. That's great. But it's a far better thing to possess it. Because of Jesus, now peace has a presence in us. It's also a prize. Christmas means we win, right? It means Jesus won. Well, one of the prizes of victory is peace. It's what happened in Europe when World War II finally ended. Peace came after victory. This is one of the things that he's won for you. Not only do we have so much peace right now knowing that the victory has already been won, but we get to wait for eternal life. We got new bodies coming. That sounds awesome. We've got rest and rewards coming. We get to see Jesus face to face. There's so much peace right now and even more to come because of what Jesus already won for you. It's a prize. One more thing. Peace is a promise. Philippians 4, don't worry about anything. He said, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for what he's done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your heart and your mind as you live in Christ Jesus. Peace is about fulfilled promises and promises to come. Peace is about knowing that God is in control. Christmas proved that. In a world of chaos and mess, God came into the mess because he's in control. There's peace in that. And maybe you're thinking, again, Matt, that sounds cool. What do I do with that? And those two verses give us some direction. Don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. Worrying, that's the antithesis of peace, is it not? You cannot worry and have peace at the same time, can you? If you have figured that out, please let me know. Like, you can't do that. Worry and peace, they're oil and water. They don't go together. In fact, worry is reverse prayer. That's all it is. Worry is putting the focus on you, putting the pressure on you. As we worry, now, now I gotta be the one that provides peace for myself. I gotta make all this stuff happen. I gotta make sure that I'm in control, not only of myself, but really I gotta be in control of my surroundings. Good luck with that. Worrying puts all the pressure on you and you don't want it. Instead, prayer is the opposite. We take everything to God, everything to him in prayer. Every time you worry, which every single one of us can do that on a daily basis. Every time you worry, let that be a trigger. I mean, I gotta go to the Lord in prayer. Every time you worry, let that be a reminder. I need to go take this to God, whatever it is. We take what we're struggling with, what we need, what we're grateful for, what we're mad about, what we're hurt by, everything to God. God is not afraid of your emotions and he's certainly not afraid of your circumstances. He wants you to bring it to him. Tell him what you need. Tell him what's going on. And you don't have to have a PhD in theology to speak in some kind of language, all these proper theological terms. No, it's a conversation. It's all prayer is. Don't overthink it, just go to him. Tell him what you need. Prayer, what will prayer will do? Here's what it'll do. It will connect you to the person and the presence that is peace. And it will remind you of your position, your prize, and your promise that is peace. Bottom line, prayer is the pathway to peace. It's the pathway. So walk in it. Remember what he's already done. Thank him for what he's already done. Past tense, what he's done. Remembering is pretty powerful, is it not? When you remember things, that can stir all kinds of stuff up. Like maybe you've gone through some tough times and when you think about that, it rubs up against some scars. You start thinking about things that you wanted to forget. But what can happen is powerful things can happen on the good end too. We tend to only think about the bad or remember the bad. But what happens when we remember good things? Stir stuff up too, that's powerful. If you think about a joyful time, that's going to stir up joy. If I think about my wedding day, that stirs up some joy. If you think about something that's funny, you're gonna laugh, right? Think about last year taking my kids skiing. That's a great time. That brings me joy. I think about doing a yard sale in front of them, which that always happens right underneath the lift line. Have you ever noticed that? Or at least, am I the only one that that happens to? I always wipe out right underneath the lift line. My kids, they don't ski over, pick up my skis and my poles. No, they ski right over to me, hockey stop point and laugh and say, yard sale, daddy. That's funny to me, maybe not to you, but it's funny to me. Like, I like thinking about that stuff. Man, I remember the good stuff. The same thing happens with God. When, when you remember who he is, what he's done, man, that will stir your affections for him and it'll help you remember, oh, he's got this. He is in control. I can relax. I got some peace now. 
or remembering about that time when you felt like your life was going to fall apart and it didn't, well, I'll give you some peace and sanity right now that it's not going to happen in the present either. Remember who God is, what he's done, how he's made good on his promises. That will give you peace that he's going to do it moving forward. I mean, think about Mary and Joseph. They had every reason to freak out. They got a newborn. And every parent knows that sleep apnea and dirty diapers is not the equation for peace. We all know that. They also got an infant genocide going on around them. Herod is killing all of the babies in all of Judea, trying to get rid of the Messiah, trying to kill the baby that they're holding in their arms right now. They probably have friends that had kids killed in that genocide instead of the baby that they're holding. Now they're thinking about that too. And then on top of that, they've got to raise the son of God now. No pressure. I struggle with my three. Why don't you raise the son of God? I would freak out too. They have every reason to freak out, but they're not. Why? Because they remember who God is, what he's done, how he's made good on his promises in the past. So why would he not take care of them right now? Why would he not take care of you right now? Mary and Joseph had peace because they remembered that God is in control and what he's already done. They also experienced peace because they obeyed God. They did what he said. And throughout scripture, you will see people that were obedient to the Lord were some of the most peaceful people that you can find in scripture. Some of those people went through the most horrific, crazy conflict, chaos stuff that you can imagine, but they had complete peace because they obeyed God. Maybe the reason right now that you're not experiencing peace, maybe the reason is because you're running from Jesus. I spent a three-year period disobeying God and running from him. And in those three years, no peace in my life. Obedience to the Lord is the first step towards peace. So maybe for Christmas, maybe your next step is, and I just need to obey God and turn back to Jesus. That's what repentance is. Christmas is proof that God reached down to you, that God brought peace to you. Are you willing to reach out to the peace that's already reaching out to you? When you celebrate this year, starting today, remember that peace is promises fulfilled and promises to come. Remember that God is in control right now. No matter what is going on in your world, no matter what's going to come tomorrow, God is in control. That's where you will find peace. And remember that if you want the kingdom, if you want the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the goodness, the self-control, if you want the joy, if you want the purpose, if you want the satisfaction, if you want the victory, if you want the freedom, if you want the hope, all of that comes with the kingdom and more. You got to have the king first. And run to the king. He's already come and he's coming back. We've got peace in that. So right now, let's reflect on that. We're gonna, we're gonna take communion together as a church. And if you're new to this, if you're a Christian or not a Christian, you don't have to worry about this. You don't have to take this right now. Just reflect on anything that might've been said that's stirring in you. That's not coming from me then. If something's sticking out to you and something's stirring something in your mind or your heart, that's not from me, that's from the Lord. Meditate on that. You can pray about that. Just talk to him about that during this time. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the bread, it's in the top. This little piece of cracker or bread, this, this represents Jesus' his body, his broken body. And something I like to do every time with communion is I'll take this cracker, this bread, I'll just break it in my fingers. Reminding me, let me remember that his body was broken so that I could have peace. So let's take this together, let's take the body together. Then there's the juice. This represents Christ's blood and how it was spilled for you. And because his blood was spilled for you and for me, that's how we are justified through our faith with God. If Jesus didn't die on the cross for you, if he didn't die on the cross for me, we have no peace and we have no hope, but he did. And it all started at Christmas. So let's take his blood, remembering that this was spilled for us. Father, thank you for peace. Thank you for peace with you, peace with the church and in the church. God, thank you so much 
for the peace that's coming because you're coming back, Jesus, you're king and we wanna celebrate that. We wanna worship you. Let us experience your peace that goes beyond all understanding. Give us peace of mind and heart in our church. Let revival start in here and let us not only experience your peace, but let us take it Monday through Saturday out to Northern Colorado. Just like we get to give out hope and grace and truth and let our church be a church that hands out peace. I pray that everyone in this room right now, whatever's going on in here, whatever's going on online, Father, I pray blessing over every individual here that you would bring your peace to them, that they would experience it today, that they would be overwhelmed by it, even if chaos and conflict come to them today, that they have your peace. We ask for that and expect it. In Jesus' name, amen.